Let me invite you all to take your seats. Uh, a couple of uh, laundry matters to take care of. For those of you that are here earning 4.5 hours of CLE credit, that means that's a whole lot of nonsense you don't have to listen to in other rooms to fill your, your annual thing. Um, uh, the CLE materials are in the book that you would have given if you'd signed up for CLE credit. And there's also um, a card in there on where to mail the form if you need to do that, okay? Uh, 4.5 hours of CLE credit if you've been with us all day. Um, so this next panel, that last one was the academic neutral version of what's going wrong with executive powers. This one um, is more devoted to, let me get the exact title here, um, uh, the politicization of the political of the executive branch uh, that we've been witnessing over the last number of years. Uh, I'll be moderating the panel, but I, I want to kind of lay the groundwork for this for a couple of cases that I've been involved with that really demonstrates, I think, in a high-profile uh, way what's happening. Uh, it was mentioned at the panel er earlier this morning uh, that what's happening at the IRS, um, uh, uh, Richard Nixon only tried to do. This administration has actually succeeded in doing it and gone beyond what even Nixon even contemplated or tried to do. Um, I was the chairman of the board of the National Organization for Marriage when our donor list was accidentally leaked to our political opponents so that the people that were donating to our organization could be harassed and threatened and what have you. Uh, our Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence is also currently representing True the Vote. Uh, which filed its application way back in 2010 to get 501c4, no, so, excuse me, c3 status. Uh, and that, that normally takes a couple of months to get through. Uh, four years later, we finally had to file suit. Uh, a week after we filed suit, the IRS gave us the 501c3 letter and then claimed the whole case was moot, you know, despite the fact that we had all those damages in the meantime. Well, we took that decision dismissing our case up to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, and two months ago, uh, the D.C. Circuit ruled in our favor that it was not moot, that there was sufficient evidence of ongoing illegal conduct by the IRS uh, based on people's political views. Um, when the judge opened the oral argument uh, for the IRS attorney and said, given all that we now know, why should I believe a word you say? That's what you kind of say is this is this argument's going well for my side <laughs> when they ask that on the other on the other side. She then proceeded to lie twice more to the court right there in open court. And I had my two minutes left over at the end. I said, I'm really stunned, but I get to now say this in my closing two minutes. Here's what she said. Here's what the thing actually says. Here's what she said here. Here's what she said down in the court below. Um, but this is going on uh, to an increasing level. We have three very distinguished panelists to join us. Uh, uh, to uh, elaborate on those kind of things, not just with the IRS, but much broader. Uh, Dean Reuter uh, is the co-editor uh, co of our book with John Yu that uh, has kind of framed our conversation today. Uh, he's also the vice president and director of practice groups at the Federalist Society. Um, he served uh, in two federal government agency offices as inspector general uh, and counsel to the inspector general and deputy uh, inspector general um, responsible for policing the legal use of federal funds contracted through federal agencies. Um, so he's going to have quite a, a bit to say about that. We ne next have Hans von Spakovsky. And, you know, it's taken me years to get that name to come off so easily <laughs> off of this. Um, Hans actually... Uh, uh, is a co-member of the board of the Public Interest Legal Foundation with me, and so I have to try and practice that name quite a lot. Um, but of all these voting rights cases that you're seeing going, and the ability to actually confirm that only citizens are casting votes, uh, Hans has been instrumental uh, in advancing um, some of those issues, and he is currently the manager of the Election Law Reform Institute and a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, which is mentioned over at lunch as one of our other co-sponsors for the end today. And then finally, we've got um, Lawrence Van Dyke, who's the Solicitor General of Nevada and working with that tremendously aggressive and sharp shop up in Nevada uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, Adam Laxalt, whom you heard the, uh, from, you heard, from whom you heard this morning. Um, he's the Chief Appellate and Legal Issues Attorney for the State of, Nis of Nevada as Solicitor General and a legal advisor to Attorney General Laxalt. Um, he supported in that uh, 
uh, office uh, by a deputy or solicitor general um, uh, uh, who's a former Lincoln fellow or Publius fellow, I forget which one, Joey Tartakovsky, um, who uh, uh, is, is another of our Claremont uh, moles that we kind of send around to the world in key spots to trying to take back the Constitution of the United States. Uh, we won't hold it against him, but he graduated uh, from Harvard Law School. He did serve as a law clerk to uh, the Honorable Janice Rogers Brown, who, as I mentioned in our luncheon today, uh, was the first recipient of our Jurisprudence Award. So we're delighted to have all of them with us, and I'll now turn it over to Dean Reuter to kick things off. Thank you, John. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, John Eastman and thanking Claremont and thanking Chapman. Of course, thanking you all for being here. Uh, we're talking about the politicization of the executive branch. That's a hard word to say, so I'm going to change it to weaponization, which is uh, <laughs> basically the same thing. Uh, I, I want to recap a little bit of what, what uh, we learned this morning, just to make sure that it hits home with folks. Um, and I, I, th because I think it's the source of the, sort of the hubris you see in executive branch agencies. Uh, and the, the simple fact is that the agency structure we have now, we have it by design. This is the way it's actually supposed to be set up. Um, so when, when you're given that sort of power, Madison says this in, in Federalist 47, that's the very definition of tyranny. We have established agencies that run sort of parallel to the structure of government as we know it, as described in the Constitution, that have just outsized power. We've talked about it a little bit in broad terms of separation of powers, but I want to talk for a moment about separation of powers within the agencies themselves, uh, because there is no separation of powers within the agencies. And this all sort of works to, I think, embolden agency actors. So we've all heard the expression judge, jury, and executioner, and we know that to be a bad thing. Uh, but when it comes to agency powers, uh, agencies are also <coughs> lawmakers and prosecutors, in addition to being judge, juries, and executioners. Uh, they get to define the infractions in the first place. They get to promote the law. They get to uh, establish the law uh, because they're given vague, broad powers by Congress. So in the first instance, these agencies actor, agency actors are defining infractions. And then uh, the staff investigate, the same agency staff investigate the regulated community. They're investigating you and me to find out whether or not we violated the laws they've just made. And when they're doing that, we heard a little bit about this, they're carrying guns sometimes. Uh, uh, they come in great numbers. They certainly come with subpoenas, if, if not with guns in all cases. Uh, then, uh, if they decide to move forward, they bring your case before an administrative law judge. Somebody talked about this earlier. I think John Shu talked about this. These ALJs are often employees of the very agencies that have defined the infraction and have investigated you, and they are now deciding your case. Uh, they're often employees of the agency. And these proceedings in front of the ALJ don't have the standard rules of evidence, uh, so you don't know what's coming. Uh, you don't have regular procedures that you'd have in an Article III court. These are not Article III judges. Uh, and um, by now, you've expended tons of money and tons of time. You might want to do something in your backyard. You're not doing it. You might be incurring daily uh, violation fines uh, for having challenged the agency action. Uh, and then the ALJ renders a decision. Now, at that point, there might be one of two different courses of action. You might be able to get into an Article III court at last, but you might also have to go to the agency head. And, and uh, John Shu mentioned at the CFPB, you go to Richard Cordray, the one agency head. I want to give another example, and it's the FTC, just to, just to point out how absurd this process can be and how it emboldens agencies uh, with, with a great deal of power. Uh, at the FTC, the FTC has one administrative law judge, an employee of the entity. W and the, uh, that ALJ, to his credit, fines for the agency about half the time, fines for the regulated community about half the time. So you think, oh, I've got a pretty good shot. Your next step in that process is to go to the full commission, the five-member Federal Trade Commission. Now, 100% of the time, the ALJ fines for the agency, the commission affirms the ALJ. 100% of the time. 100% of the cases where the ALJ fines for the regulated community, the full commission reverses the ALJ. <laughs> so you have no shot at winning uh, at the FTC level. 
Now, ultimately, you do end up in federal court if you're you know, rich enough to go that far. But by that time, you run into something called federal deference. This is the notion that judges defer to agency action. There's a presumption that what the agencies have done, they've done well and properly. So what it amounts to in, in, for your day in court is a, a heavy thumb on the scales. So you start with a presumption that the agency which just found against you was correct. So that's sort of the lay of the land. And I think operating in a system like that, in a silo uh, for these agency staff, just emboldens you. I keep coming back to that word, but uh, I think it's apt. Uh, these agency staff uh, also, they sort of live in a silo and they live under rules of employment that insulate them from accountability, not just the political kind of accountability you have uh, and you expect with uh, elected officials who should be making the laws. Um, so it, it sort of gets worse from there, and I want to talk on w one topic that was left uh, uh, unmentioned this morning um, because I think it's symptomatic of uh, not just the, the, the lay of the land as it exists, but the agency's increasing lust for power. And this is a phenomenon called sue and settle. Uh, some of the lawyers in the room probably know about this. If you're not a lawyer, you don't know about it. Um, but even though these agencies have outsized power to begin with, they sometimes yearn for more. Sue and settle is essentially a collusive lawsuit filed by an outside entity. So let's say defenders of wildlife will sue the Environmental Protection Agency, hypothetically and uh, they want the EPA to regulate in a certain area. And it might be clear that EPA has no authority to regulate there. It might be unclear whether or not they have authority. But what happens then, after the lawsuit is filed by Defenders of Wildlife, EPA throws up, throws up its hands and says, oh, okay, we'll settle. We agree to regulate in this area. Uh, and then the court puts its imprimatur on that settlement and power that they didn't have that morning, the EPA now has to regulate in a whole new area. And it is discouraging. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, um, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure of that detail. The question was, do they pay attorney's fees? Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the question might arise in people's minds, how do you know that's collusive? How, how can you be sure that sort of the, the jig is up here? And I've got to say before I address that question, these consent decrees can't be undone by a subsequent administration. You come in as a new head of the EPA under a new president, and you cannot undo a court order. Uh, you can undo a regulation. You can undo a guideline or an FAQ on a website. You can't undo a, a, uh, a court order. Uh, but one way to tell these things are collusive is um, the case that I described to you, which is not a hypothetical. It's actually Defenders of wild ver Wildlife versus Persheppi. Persh Persh sorry. Defenders of Wildlife versus Persheppi. The lawsuit was filed and as, dis, as the Circuit Court of Appeals later observed, simultaneously with the lawsuit, the consent decree signed by EPA was filed. So we have a lawsuit and a resolution on the same day. And that, that consent decree wasn't saying just we agree to regulate. It had a whole schedule of regulatory actions going forward. So this was uh, not a real lawsuit. Um, and this is just <sighs> sort of one example of agencies and how they can expand their power. Um, I want to get to some, uh, what I would call bad apples in agencies, but I want to start by saying that I've worked in a couple agencies. I actually uh, over, help oversee a, a federal contract, a federal grant making agency right now. Um, and most of the people that work in agencies I find to be just like the rest of us, they live next, if you're living in Washington, they live next door to you or across the street. They're regular people, they're well-intentioned, but they're living and operating in a system where all they have is power, uh, all they can do is regulate and enforce, and so that's what they do. And if you're within one of these agencies, federal regulation of financial services quickly becomes the most important thing in the world, or the environment, or food and drug. Wherever you are living as an agency staff, uh, you live in a silo. And all you see uh, is you, you want to be important, you want to do something meaningful. Uh, so if you're doing your job well within the system as designed, uh, you're, you're probably doing a disservice. Um, then put those good people aside, and that's probably 95% of the people in government are, are well-intentioned. There are the bad apples. <laughs> there are people who are out for blood. Uh, 
And um, there, there are some per perverse results. And I just want to give two examples. Uh, one uh, comes out of uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. And this is a regional uh, authority of the Environmental Protection Agency who gave a speech not unlike this one. Uh, and he likened his regulatory authority to that of the conquering Romans. Uh, and he went on to describe it as you go into, like the Romans did, the Romans would go into a town, crucify the first five people uh, they saw, and then the rest of the town would pretty much fall into step in terms of uh, complying with regulations. And he used the words like Romans and crucify. So this is uh, a real sort of bloodlust for power and really goes beyond the pale. Uh, the other example I want to give, just because I think it's, it, it would be humorous if it weren't so serious, and again, John, John Chu almost touched on this. It comes out of the CFPB, that Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, that we heard so much about. He mentioned uh, disparate impact. That's the idea that statistics will show us that one class of people has been disfavored, uh, so even without intent, the government will go against you. Uh, the CFPB extracted a settlement of $98 million from a group called Allied Financial, who is a lender. And in order to do this, they used something called the Bayesian Improved Surname Geocoding Method. And when you hear a mouthful like that, you know you're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> If the government shows up and they, they have that in their hands, just roll over. Um, so this is a, a, a method of statistical analysis uh, by which they examined Allied Financial's entire loan portfolio. So they had everybody's names, their addresses, zip codes, and the terms and the fees they paid for the loans. And this method renders a result that, that explains to CFPB that this group of people are minorities, this group are not, and then the CFPB works its magic and figures out, well, the, the minorities, not including Asians, John Chu, uh, <laughs> got disproportionately bad fees and terms. So that meets the, the disparate impact de definition of discrimination. So you owe us $98 million, says the CFPB to Allied Financial. So the, the last step in this process, CFPB is going to pay back some of this money to the minorities who suffer discrimination, only to find out that the Bayesian improved surname geocoding method is about as reliable as a coin toss. So not only were the minorities getting bad terms, the, the non-minorities were getting bad terms, and it's just a mess. They don't know what to do with the money. Um, but my suggestion is that you go back to sort of the roots of this problem and realize um, it's taken 150 years, as Michael Ullman said this morning, to get here. Uh, I've heard people ask about solutions. It's a long haul back. It's not impossible. Uh, I'm not discouraged. I tend to be more on the optimistic than the pessimistic side. But um, with that, I will um, <laughs> sit down. So that's the optimism. Well, I'm Hans von Spakovsky. Uh, John, thanks for inviting me here to speak. Uh, John and I do a lot of work together, as, as he mentioned. Um, the subject is the politicization of the executive branch. Uh, I prefer the word weaponization because, in fact, that describes exactly what the Obama administration has done over the past eight years, and that is to try to use the enormous power of the executive branch um, to help their political friends, hurt their political enemies, and uh, implement their utopian vision, progressive utopian vision, of how the United States should run, uh, no matter what Congress or anyone else says. And I, frankly, tend to be very pessimistic about being able to stop this because of the fact that the government today, the federal government today, is so, so large and so powerful. And there was a question earlier today about, you know, what would the framers think about this? Well. Um, our federal government today has much greater power than King George did when they fought a revolution to throw him out. So I think they would be, frankly, totally shocked uh, about this. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ju uh, Justice Department, because I spent four years there, actually as a career civil servant, not as a political appointee, uh, during the Bush administration. And uh, in fact, two years ago, um, uh, John Fund, who's the uh, national Affairs Correspondent for National Review, and I actually wrote a book about um, the Justice Department and how it's been under Eric Holder. It's called Obama's Enforcer, Eric Holder's Justice Department. 
And I talked to a lot of people that I knew who were still working there. And what they all said to me was that Eric Holder had politicized the Justice Department to an extent they had never seen before. And one lawyer in particular who uh, is a very experienced uh, lawyer when it comes to uh, voting, voting cases and federal voting rights laws, and who was hired during the Clinton administration, told me that uh, Eric Holder was the worst person to hold the position since John Mitchell, who, as you know, <laughs> went to jail uh, under Richard Nixon. Now, of course, after being the first attorney general in U.S. history to be held in contempt by the House of Representatives for refusing to turn over and hiding documents connected to what I think is probably the most scandalous and reckless law enforcement operation ever engaged in by the Justice Department, Operation Fast and Furious, he, of course, retired to a very lucrative career in private practice. And that operation, which he, of course, denied all knowledge of, um, resulted not only in the death of an American border agent, but has literally resulted in the deaths of hundreds of Mexican citizens because of the weapons that they allowed to go across the border. And I don't know if you all saw this. There wasn't a lot of mention of it. But remember, not too long ago, um, the Mexican police recaptured El Chapo. Remember El Chapo was the drug lord in Mexico who escaped from prison. They recaptured him. Guess what they found in his house when they recaptured him? They found one of the weapons that had been sold through Operation Fast and Furious and smoke across the border, a 50 caliber sniper rifle. Now, you can't just dismiss this as my opinion because there's case after case in the federal courts over the past few years where federal judges have uh, complained and criticized the department for the behavior of its prosecutors. For example, there was a case in Louisiana in 2013, and the federal judge in that case wrote, uh, frankly, one of the most extraordinary and shocking opinions I've ever read. In it, he discussed, and this is a quote, the grotesque prosecutorial abuse and skullduggery of DOJ lawyers. Skullduggery is one of those words you read in like Nancy Drew uh, mysteries. <laughs> I, I've never seen one before uh, in a federal opinion. And in, in essence, what happened in that case, this is a prosecution of um, some New Orleans police officers after uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina, was that um, prosecutors within the Justice Department anonymously took to social media and blog posts to go after the defendants, their lawyers. Uh, they revealed grand jury um, uh, information. And one of the lawyers who was doing this um, was what's called the taint attorney. Um, the taint attorney at the Justice Department, in criminal cases, you know, police officers um, can't assert the Fifth Amendment when their police department is doing an internal investigation of what happened. And because of that, what they say in that internal investigation can't be used against them if they are later criminally prosecuted. The taint attorney at the Justice Department's job is to ensure the constitutional rights of the defendants are protected and that any tainted evidence is not used. Well, the lawyer who was supposed to be protecting the defendants was one of the anonymous bloggers on, uh, on this case. Now, you would think that someone who engaged in that kind of unethical, unprofessional behavior, if they were in a private law firm, they would be kicked out the door immediately. Well, she still works at the U.S. Department of Justice. Okay, and that's a typical example. Um, another example of this, and you haven't heard much about this, is uh, there have been a number of decisions in recent years where courts have accused the Justice Department of abusing the FACE Act. Um, the FACE Act is the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrance Act. You know, this was a law that was uh, unanimously passed by Congress to prevent violence at abortion clinics. Now, when Congress passed that law, they made it very clear this was to stop violence, not to stop First Amendment speech. So you can protest and speak outside an abortion clinic. You just can't threaten people or, or engage in violence. During the Bush administration, there was one prosecution. There have been numerous prosecutions uh, under this administration, and many of those cases have been thrown out because, and, and here's a typical case from 2012, um, where the federal judge made it clear that he thought it was a political prosecution because of the nearly total lack of evidence of any violation of, of the law and the, quote, 
negligent and perhaps even grossly negligent behavior of DOJ lawyers in the case. In other words, because the administration is pro-abortion, they wanted to squelch the political speech of individuals uh, at these. And this, this is a clear abuse of the law. Now, you might think that's, well, that's just a couple of cases. Uh, you all know the big immigration case, right? Remember U.S. v. Texas? Uh, that's the case where 26 states sued over the president's um, plan to grant amnesty to about 5 million illegal aliens. Well, you know that case is pending back down in the federal court. You know, a, an injunction was issued that was upheld by the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, a split decision. That case is pending down in the federal district court down in Texas because the judge, uh, they're arguing about the sanctions that the judge is going to impose on the DOJ lawyers in the case because the, the judge says the DOJ lawyers lied to him in court. When he was issuing an injunction against the president implementing this plan, Justice Department lawyers assured him that the plan was not being implemented. That was an absolute lie. And they repeatedly told him in court that the plan was not being implemented when it was. Uh, none of those individuals, uh, Justice Department lawyers, have been disciplined. And why is that? Well, because they're carrying out the, the policy preferences of, of the administration. Um, we've talked a lot about the Tea Party cases. And it wasn't just this recent decision uh, that, that John was talking about, but a couple of months ago, the Sixth Circuit also issued a decision, and in that case, it's a, those decisions make it very clear that uh, officials of the IRS knew exactly what they were doing, that this was clearly intended to go after the political opponents of the president prior to his 2002 re-election, and in fact, in the most recent decision, it was clear from the, what the judges were saying that um, the, the IRS had not entirely stopped its behavior because there were a couple of Tea Party organizations that after all these years still hadn't gotten their tax-exempt status. And most importantly, there was nothing to prevent the IRS from doing this again. And why would there be? There was never any punishment of any of the individuals at the IRS who did anything about this. The Justice Department refused to criminally prosecute anyone. They even refused to enforce the contempt citation that was issued against Lois Lerner by the House of Representatives for refusing to answer questions. Now, what you all don't know is there's actually a federal statute. There's a federal statute that says that when Congress holds someone in contempt, that contempt citation is sent to the United States Attorney in the District of Columbia. And he shall, not may, not it's not an option. He has to present that to a federal grand jury. And the grand jury decides whether or not to enforce that contempt citation. And you can be fined and you can go to jail. And the U.S. attorney <laughs> refused to do it. He refused to enforce that contempt citation. The same way, by the way, he refused to enforce the contempt citation uh, against Eric Holder. Now, there's a great quote from one of these Tea Party cases. And it's a long quote, but I want to read this to you because it really epitomizes what was going on here. Um, Among the most serious allegations a federal court can address are that an executive agency has targeted citizens for mistreatment based on their political views. No citizen, Republican or Democrat, socialist or libertarian, should be targeted or even have to fear being targeted on these grounds. Yet these are the grounds on which the plaintiffs allege they were mistreated by the IRS here. The allegations are substantial. And in fact, in one of the court cases, um, the court said the IRS really hasn't contested this. And yet, the IRS and their DOJ lawyers fought having to do the most basic thing, which was uh, to even turn over the names of the employees at the IRS who were involved in this mistreatment. They refused to abide by a district court order ordering them to turn over this information and then went all the way to the Court of Appeals asking the court to issue something you rarely hear in legal circles about a writ of mandamus to basically tell the lower court judge, you can't order us to turn over this information about who was engaging in this kind of political targeting. And the court, of course, 
denied it, saying that was an extraordinary uh, remedy reserved to correct only the clearest abuses of power by a district court. And the abuse of power here was by the IRS, not by the district court. Oh, that's another, that's <laughs> another issue we'll have to deal with. I, I'm not sure that it's very hard to keep members of the executive uh, in branch. By the way, um, you know, one of the problems we have here, and this goes back to my experience at the Justice Department, is uh, uh, Dean Reuter was being polite, <laughs> okay, when he said that he figures 95% of career people are okay, and that was not my experience. <laughs> okay. um, the civil service of the federal government is very similar to, you know, the, you, you all have, I know on constant occasions have seen the polling done of journalists and people in the media, right? And the polling always says that, you know, upwards of 90, 95 percent of them are liberals and Democrats. Okay, I'm, I hate to tell you, the same is, is true in the career ranks of the civil service. And um, when I was, I was in one of the worst sections you could possibly be in, which was the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, okay? <laughs> and uh, actually a couple of years ago, uh, there was an investigation done by the Inspector General, and he criticized the division because he said that they were hiring a majority of the lawyers, not, not into political posts, but into the career civil service positions, which were supposed to be nonpartisan, from only five well-known advocacy organizations, the National Council of La Raza, the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, the ACLU, and others like that. So in other words, they're hiring liberal advocacy lawyers and putting them into the career ranks. And those lawyers don't make the transition to be knowing that they're supposed to be a neutral lawyer who represents the people. They just say, ooh, now I've got the power of the government to keep doing what I was doing at these advocacy organizations. And you can't fire them. In fact, when they, when they engage in wrongdoing, like the lawyers I just was talking about, they're, they're, they're congratulated for what they did. They're not disciplined. They're not fired. And they break the merit service rules to hire these individuals. But what goes on throughout the executive branch is that managers who do the hiring uh, replicate themselves by hiring liberals and others. I used to tell folks when I was at the division uh, who wanted to get a job, I said, you want to get a job there, be sure you take off of your resume that you're a member of the Federalist Society or that you were a member of college Republicans, because if you do, if, if you leave that on there, you're, I don't care how qualified you are, your resume is going to go right into the trash. So. We have a tough time because it, when a Republican president, for example, comes in, and assuming they actually want to change things, they have almost the entire civil service fighting against them, trying to stop what they do, uh, when they're ordered to do things they don't like, leaking it to the press, whereas when a Democratic president comes in, this whole career civil service is on their side, trying to help them do things. And that's one of the biggest problems we have. And that's not going to change until and unless we radically modify and get rid of the career civil service rules that basically say that when you're hired by the federal government, you, you cannot be fired. Now, is this going to get any better? Uh, no. At last week, I sat down and I counted up the number of federal judges that have been uh, appointed by and confirmed by uh, President Obama. 38% of the federal judges at all levels of government. If the next president who comes in picks a liberal to sit on the US Supreme Court uh, in the seat that uh, unfortunately is no longer held by Justice Scalia, um, they will have a solid five uh, uh, liberal majority on the court. And most of the Bill of Rights will get written right out of the uh, co uh, uh, Constitution. Uh, your First Amendment rights, religious freedom rights, will all get um, overridden. Your Second Amendment rights will go right out the window. They will reverse the, the recent cases, Heller and McDonald, that upheld Second Amendment rights. Uh, just one case after another. And in the area of election integrity, where I work, look, for the last eight years, the administration has been waging a war on election integrity. They want to dictate the rules 
that is the province of the states on how to run elections. So they've been attacking voter ID laws. They've been attacking um, rules on early voting and saying it's a constitutional violation if you don't have a certain number of early voting days. That is, that is one of the most absurd legal propositions I've ever heard. Uh, the, the Ohio Democratic Party sued the state of Ohio saying that because Ohio had gone from 35 days of early voting to 29 days of early voting, that was a violation of the Constitution. <laughs> and a lower court agreed with them. Now, there is no constitutional right to early voting. The only, vote, the only right you've got is to vote on Election Day. But there are courts all over the country that are uh, saying, and most of them are Obama appointees, saying uh, if you reduce early voting days, it's not only a constitutional violation, it's discriminatory under the Voting Rights Act. Um, a a three-judge panel, the Fourth Circuit, just said that because the state of North Carolina got rid of same-day registration, they discriminated under the Voting Rights Act. What's going on here is trying to have the federal government dictate, as liberal advocacy groups want, uh, how we run elections in this country and basically have the judiciary taking over and dictating to the states how they can run elections. And the whole point of that is to make sure that they win elections. Uh, the final thing on this, which just infuriates me every time I think about it, is, and this is both a sign of what they want to do in the election area and how bad the Justice Department has gotten is, look, there's a lawsuit ongoing in Washington, D.C., which I'm sure you've heard nothing about, where a number of liberal groups, including the League of Women Voters, sued the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Now, you've never heard of this agency. This is the agency that's in charge of the federal voter registration form. You know, this is a one-page form you can fill out and register anywhere in the country. Kansas, Alabama, Georgia, Arizona, all changed their laws to say that when you register to vote, you have to provide proof that you are a U.S. citizen. Now, those of you who live in California know that there's evidence that non-citizens are registering and voting all over the country. This is the 20th anniversary, remember, of the Bob Dornan, Loretta Sanchez race, where it was found that hundreds of non-citizens had voted in a race decided by only 1,000 votes. Um, the Justice Department's duty, as you know, is to come in and defend federal agencies when they are sued. Kansas and these other states asked the EAC to change the instructions on their website for anyone who uses the Federal Voter Registration Form to let them know that if they use that form to register in Kansas, for example, they're also going to have to provide proof they're a U.S. citizen. The Justice Department, instead of coming in and defending this federal agency, colluded with the plaintiffs in this case and came in and tried to throw the case and said, no, we agree with the League of Women Voters. What the agency did was, was wrong, and you, judge, should issue an injunction against it. The, judge Leon, the federal district court judge, a Reagan appointee, said that he had never seen anything like this in his entire legal career. But that shows how they are willing to do whatever it takes, even if it's unethical and unprofessional, to achieve their goals. And that's why uh, whether we are going to be able to do anything about this in the future, particularly if even Worse, federal judges are appointed. I don't know, so I'm a pessimist. Thanks. <laughs> so I probably definitely should hold this right because this is not going to reach. I don't think. Um, so, uh, so Hans, I've worked in I guess three different state governments now, and my experience has been similar to Hans' experience in federal government with. Uh, so I'm not sure what the deal with, with Dean is. I'm starting to wonder now about his bona fides. <laughs> maybe, maybe he just felt a lot more comfortable than, than uh, we did. But no, I think I agree with both of them. I, I, I've uh, met a lot of great people in government that really do want to um, try to help. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Dr. Eastman and, and the Claremont Institute and the Federalist Society for this opportunity. I mean, it's a real honor for me, um, a little bit surreal to be on a panel with, with uh, Dean and Hans and, and uh, John. It is an honor because, you know, I, I graduated law school back in 2005, and honestly, the uh, Claremont Institute, I did the Publius Fellowship right after um, I graduated, um, actually was studying for the bar exam while I was, while I was uh, 
doing that. And I've, I've had ties to the Federal Society since law school. So it's not an overstatement to say that, that the Claremont Institute and the Federal Society have, have had a huge formative impact on the way I view the law and on the trajectory of my legal career because when I went to law school, I was an engineering undergrad. I didn't um, I was going to be like a contracts lawyer or something like that, and it really was these these organizations that piqued my interest in constitutional law and led to me um, being the going to work in government so I could so I could do constitutional law so I could serve um, attorney generals like uh, General Axalt, who you heard this morning. Uh, and it's been a, a real pleasure. I serve as a Nevada SG, um, the Solicitor General. Um, I, I wear a couple of different hats in that role. One of the one of the hats is I oversee all of the appeals for the state of Nevada. Um, which means I don't, we don't do them all. We're a small office, but we, we oversee them all. So if something wrong happens, it's because of an oversight. But if, if it goes really good, we get to take the credit for it. I'm also the uh, top constitutional advisor to Attorney General Laxalt, who you, which means that when he asks me really hard questions, I go to Joseph Tartakovsky and immediately ask him <laughs> what the right answer is. Um, and then uh, the other thing we do, which is most relevant to what I'm going to talk about this morning, is um, we have, I guess, I, I think Adam has has recently been calling it the federalism unit which is kind of a cool name so we have the federalism unit within our SG's office and that what that means is we push back against federal overreach often that's in the form of lawsuits as you'll hear this morning but there is, as you as you heard or, or as you'll hear this afternoon but as you heard from Adam this morning every once in a while we we actually uh, resolve one without litigation not very often unfortunately as General Laxalt noted this morning 86 percent of our land in Nevada is is federal land, so we really do get, I think, more than our fair share of impact from some of this federal overreach, especially as regards land issues, EPA type issues, and stuff like that. So what I'd like to um, do this afternoon is, what I'd hope to provide is sort of a boots on the ground or in the trenches perspectives, um, and, and which I think will be encouraging to this group a little bit, because it really is the state attorneys general um, who are in a lot of ways leading the fight. A lot of the lawsuits we've talked about, that you've already heard talked about this morning, ha have been coalitions of attorneys general. Sometimes private, private entities also, but oftentimes a coalition. Attorneys general, the immigration lawsuit, ones that you've heard of, ones that you haven't, that I'll tell you a little bit about this morning. And so I, hopefully that's encouraging um, to see that there is at least some hope. Some people are still fighting the good fight. Uh, I want to talk about a few of these issues that we've been involved in in our office. Um, and I'm going to quickly summarize each issue talk about it at a high level. Um, you can ask more questions during Q&A if you're interested. Um, what I'd like to do is focus a little bit on some of the lesser known issues. We've already mentioned some and I'll, I'll mention them, but um, there's a few more that, that you uh, haven't, haven't heard of probably that our office is involved in and maybe show you that a lot of times, you know, you know there's the high profile things like immigration, clean power plants, stuff like that, that you, you, know, you, can, you have heard of, but there's a lot of stuff that's very impactful that you haven't heard of that really affects the states. Um, and then I, I do want to, if, if we have time at the very end, I want to uh, get an indulgence from uh, J John that uh, talk about one thing that's not exactly federal executive overreach, but, uh, but I think you'll find interesting. And mostly I just want to whine to a friendly audience about the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I, I will give a disclaimer, uh, the obvious disclaimer that I'm speaking as a private citizen. And since Adam's already had to catch a plane home, he, can't, he probably wouldn't catch me anyway, but um, he may not agree with everything that I say. So um, let me start with the waters of the U.S. You've, I think, you know, General Axalt alluded to that, but you may not know um, much about that. I don't, um, it, the EPA and the Army Corps, um, ever since the, the Clean Water Act was passed in 1975, the EPA and the, and the Army Corps have been trying to expand the, the meaning of waters of the U.S., waters of the United States, which is a term in, in um, the Clean Water Act, in order to expand their authority. And um, the Supreme Court has repeatedly rebuffed them in, in two cases in particular. In 2001, in a case that is called SWANK, it stands for something, um, but SWANK is a cool way to say it. Um, they, they said, no, you can't um, interpret it expansively. Um, and then in a 2006 decision called Rapanos, um, they did it again, this time though in a split decision with Kennedy and his own concurrence. But undeterred, the agencies last year uh, again sought to broadly define the waters of the U.S. and did it in a way that, you know, so, so traditionally it was kind of thought of as like navigable waters, you know, something you can row some size of boat up. But they defined it so broadly that um, in theory it would, it would take in even adjacent waters, which is pretty nebulously defined, as well as even ephemeral streams that are mostly dry, like ditches and streams that are dry most of the year. So it would be difficult to get a boat up, I would think, um, then. <laughs> And basically what they're trying to do is, so if you have a property that has one of these things that goes through it and you, tr and you, you need to get permits now, not just from 
to your state um, entities if you want to do something to develop that property, but you need to get that from um, the federal government now. And so it really is a huge federal power grab, and from the state's perspective, it's a power grab that's taking power away from the states, because typically states or local entities do land regulation, right? And so um, it really is a, a, a taking from the states. 31 states sued, and it was even a nonpartisan suit. Some, some um, Democrat states even uh, joined in and sued, Democrat AGs, in a variety, and they sued in diff different jurisdictions. Nevada joined a coalition in the Eighth Circuit. You'll be shocked to learn that none of the states, although many of the states in the Ninth Circuit sued, none of us sued in the Ninth Circuit, shocker. Um, <laughs> so we, we joined with North Dakota, and uh, we got a preliminary junction out of North Dakota, but then because of this quir quirky way that these cases may get consolidated. It ended up all getting consolidated in the, in the Sixth Circuit. Judge Batchelder, plug your ears. Um, <laughs> and it got, it got uh, consolidated in the Sixth Circuit, and so it's actually being litigated there, but we have two different stays. Um, so that's good news. It's a temporary stay. It's sort of like a preliminary injunction in the case, but you can chalk one up for the states um, on that. Sage grouse is actually a huge issue, I think in some ways bigger than waters of the U.S. for Nevada. Um, the sage grouse, you heard Adam talk about the sage chicken. Um, you've probably seen pictures of it. It looks, I, I think Joseph frequently refers to it as a punk rock chicken or something like that. I think that's his California influence coming out in him or something. But uh, the sage grouse covers 165 million acres in the western states. Um, people, you actually can still hunt the sage grouse, believe it or not, and yet it's still being considered to be listed as an endangered species um, across 11 western states. Um, and so you heard, um, I think it was Dean talking about these collusive um, lawsuits. There. So if the sage grouse, that's exactly what happened, is one of these groups sued the, um, sued, I can't remember who they sued, but uh, I guess it would be Department of the Interior, to get it listed as, a, to say you have to list it by a certain date, and, and so it was just, it was a collusive settlement. They set a, a really quick date, and then basically ran through a decision on that uh, the federal government would decide whether to list the sage grouse as endangered by September of last year. And so what ended up happening is in order to, um, using that as, as a threat, the federal government then said, okay, we're not gonna list the bird, but basically imposed all kinds of land use regulations on a lot of federal land across the western states, and especially in Nevada. Um, now, under federal law, the fed, federal government is supposed to take into account the efforts that Nevada, the plan that Nevada had put in place to preserve the sage grouse, but they completely disregarded that. And even though Nevada, since at least 2000, has had a plan and, and finalized that plan in 2012, submitted it to the Department of Interior, they just uh, threw that out the window and um, issued their own land use plan, which withdraws more than 10 million acres of federal land from historic public use in these, in these uh, 10 western states. In Nevada alone, um, it blocked all mineral exp exploration, all... Um, uh, development, including um, green energy development, on over three million acres of land. Um, in addition, it threatens restrictions, all kinds of other restrictions, livestock restrictions. This is all the northern rural land in Nevada on over 16 million acres of land. And just to give you an idea of the scope of that impact, Nevada, which is the seventh largest state in the nation, is only 70 million acres. So when this thing affects um, 16 million acres, we're talking about locking up nearly a quarter of our state of Nevada. So. So we've sued, um, obviously, and, and we've got an Obama appointee as our, as our district court judge. We were denied a preliminary injunction in that suit. It's in the Ninth Circuit. We're, you know, if we lose, we're going to appeal to the Ninth Circuit. So um, that's one of the, the challenges. But, there, but as Adam mentioned, there have been some good outcomes from that lawsuit. I think it raises the visibility of the issue. Um, I think it also it caused the federal government to at least make some of those changes that you heard Adam mention this morning about this. <laughs> saying that certain areas of Reno you could actually build a school because the sage grouse, um, uh, turns out that Reno is not sage grouse, prime sage grouse habitat. They, <laughs> they don't like the game, I guess, as much as we thought. Um, so a couple, a couple other things that you've talked, we've already talked about, immigration, um, you know, the Nevada was the 26th state to join, so right after Attorney General Axelt got elected, Nevada wasn't already a state, so it became the 26th state to join, and then soon after that, I'm sure because of that, um, the federal judge handed down a preliminary injunction, and you guys, you know, you, you know all about that. One thing I'll mention about that, though, is that last year, Attorney General Laxalt um, went and testified in front of Congress about what was then a very high-profile lawsuit and a kind of controversial multi-state lawsuit, and what he said, I think, is very relevant to our topic here. Uh, you know, and, and you've heard some talk about, you know, this, this view that all of law is just politics, right? And that's what's driving. And of course, that's said all the time about, about uh, my boss is that he's only doing this stuff because of politics. But 
Um, what he said and was, is very true, and he said that Nevada's reason for joining the lawsuit, you know, Nevada's got um, a lot of, uh, a large Hispanic population. He's taken a lot of heat for his decision to join that lawsuit, that somehow he hates um, those, th those folks. That, but what he said is, no, our immigration system is broken. It needs to be fixed. There's no question it needs to be fixed. But what I'm against is unconstitutional, unilateral, federal executive action. You know, Obama said that he couldn't do this, and now he's doing it. Um, and so, um, so, th so I think that really illustrates, you know, how these things are driven. They're not just, they're not politically driven. They're driven by our view that, you know, there's specific roles for the government, especially when it um, affects our state. Clean Power Plan, you've also heard about it. 28, 29 states joined together to challenge the Clean Power Plan. The state of, um, the state of Nevada, interestingly, so just to show that it's not always, we did not actually join that multi-state lawsuit um, because Nevada is very differently situated. Apparently, we make a lot of green energy and sell it to California is what we do with, uh, <laughs> with uh, geothermal and, and uh, wind and, and uh, solar. Um, and so we actually don't have any uh, commercial coal reserves and we, we have two old coal power uh, coal powered power plants that are quickly going going to be zoned out. So we didn't join that lawsuit because we're very differently situated than say Montana where I grew up which has got tons of coal and West Virginia etc. Um, but what we did do is um, almost every other state did. I think there's like 10 states that didn't join one side or the other of that lawsuit. But what we did do is we, we waited until um, it was before the uh, um, D.C. Circuit, and we filed an amicus brief. And again, we focused, you know, we, we said, listen, we're very differently situated. We're not impacted the way some of these other states are. But we want to talk about the problem of federal overreach and, and, and disregarding the law in this case. Um, and so I'm sure the D.C. Circuit will find that very persuasive. Um, as some of you may know, the D.C. Circuit has sort of shifted. I, I clerked for, uh, as somebody said, for Janice Rogers Brown on the D.C. Circuit, and it's somewhat changed since, the, since uh, I clerked there not actually that long ago. So EPA racing rule, I'll just mention, you know, Adam mentioned that. That's, we're kind of excited about that because we didn't actually have to sue somebody. Um, maybe that may be the only one, though. Uh, the part... Department of Labor Overtime Rule. That's what I want to talk about. This is cutting edge news. So, so listen, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Department of Labor Overtime Rule for salaried employees. Raise your hand if you, wow, it's a very erudite crowd we've got here. Um, so, so the Department of Labor just recently finalized, well, I guess back in May, finalized a rule saying that, that, that salaried employees, basically raising the threshold where salaried employees have to be paid overtime, um, more than doubling it, actually. And the reason this is important is I, I think what, what's going on here is, is President Obama would like to change the federal minimum overtime for hourly employees, but he cannot do that because even he realizes that that's very clear that that's left to Congress, and so he can't do it. So what he's done instead is he's effectively doubled the, over, the minimum wage for salaried employees. And this has huge far-reaching effects on private industry. It very much affects Nevada's um, labor-intensive tourism industry. But it also has a massive effect on states and local governments because under the Garcia case, states and local governments, um, the, the federal wage, wage regulations apply to state and local governments. So it really affects, it's kind of a commandeering um, thing that's going on, is that they can effectively say, you know what, the Obama administration say, you know what, we want you to spend, the states to spend, um, you know, uh, millions of more dollars in salary. But of course for states, you know, it's one thing for private companies to say, well, those poor companies are just going to make less profits. For states, it's really, um, it, it, it really you have to, it takes away from your programs. It's a zero sum. You know, you, you're going to pay more to salaries, so now the people. And so that's why the people and their elected representatives in the state should be able to make those policy decisions. Um, so that's a, that's a big problem, and I guess what I'll say about that is stay tuned. Um, uh, nothing's happened yet. Um, last I'll say, just in my, my, little, my, my one minute um, thing about the Ninth Circuit, and I really was glad to hear Judge Badgelder's uh, uh, talking about the, the Sixth Circuit and, and habeas cases. Um, my good friend is the Solicitor General of, of Michigan, and uh, I constantly am calling him to say, what do I do about this Ninth Circuit habeas decision? Because he's been doing it a little longer than I have. But um, you know, that's a huge issue, too, that we, you know, two, two problems with it. Um, sanctioning the Ninth Circuit, sanctioning federal over. You know, we, we do a lot of litigation in the Ninth Circuit, Joseph and I do. Um, you know, the Ninth Circuit recently, I don't know if you heard, but Ninth Circuit recently uh, held that uh, federal agency decisions of what's a critical habitat designation is unreviewable by, so they, just, they, can, they can characterize something as, federal ha as critical habitat. 
under the Endangered Species Act and it's completely unreviewable. So uh, 22 states, I think, including Nevada, filed an amicus brief asking the U.S. Supreme Court to review that case. But the other thing that's very frustrating is, 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 the, is the habeas, and I'm not going to say a lot about it because uh, uh, Judge Batchelder already talked about it in the, in the sixth, but the sixth and the ninth are known as they just disregard the fact that you're supposed to be giving some deference to the state governments, and it's just a, to the state, state, especially the state courts in this criminal law area, for constantly fighting against um, federal judges thinking they know better than the state court judges. You know, the last one we had, I think two judges on a three judge panel basically said the standard is that it's supposed to be that no unreasonable, no, no, no reasonable jurors could reach this result. And literally counting the one judge on their panel on the lower court, federal judge, and the other three, there were six judges that had reached this result, and two, two Ninth Circuit judges said, well, no, no reasonable judge could, could reach that result. <laughs> um, so it's just, it's just gross federal overreach, and I guess that brings me to my, which I'll wrap up and say, these AG lawsuits matter, and we've seen some really good results, right? Waters of the U.S. has been stayed for now. Um, immigration stayed, clean power plants stayed. I think it's really increased public awareness. The immigration lawsuit you saw did that. Um, but it obviously is not a permanent fix. Um, these are all temporary stays, if you think about it, all of them are, including the immigration, Waters of the U.S., clean power plan. They also have some limited applicability. Um, you know, we, in Sage Grouse, we have to sue in the Ninth Circuit, and you're going to get what you're going to get there. Clean power plan, D.C. Circuit, and they didn't get their stay from the D.C. Circuit. They had to get it from the Supreme Court. Which brings me back to the Ninth Circuit. Um, you know, I often say, I, I, I tell this to Joseph all the time, anytime he gets discouraged about it, I say it's fun in the Ninth Circuit because you win, it's a win-win situation. You either win, even, a, even an easy case is hard in the Ninth Circuit. So if you, if you win one, you can really feel like you earned it. But if you lose it, then you have a cert petition you get to file with the U.S. Supreme Court. And so that's always kind of exciting too. Um, the problem is though, um, and this takes us back to, to I think what was just said about, you know, it's going to stop being fun if the U.S. Supreme Court turns into the Ninth Circuit. Let me just say that. So uh, we're we living in an important time here. So, but thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, let's take some questions. And while our microphone people are walking around with our questioners, uh, when I was at the Supreme Court, we um, we had 28 cases that came up from the Ninth Circuit that year. All 28 were reversed. 26 out of the 28 were unanimous. Uh, and so we got so tired of typing the same thing out. The opinion of the Ninth Circuit is reversed. The decision of the court is unanimous. We wrote the Alt-9 macro. We just <laughs> Alt-9, and it would type that out automatically. Um, I think they're now looking at an Alt-6 macro <laughs> just to help the judge. Okay, some questions for our panelists. Yes. Yes, here. So hi, um, I, I spent some time at the Federal Trade Commission. I was a, a deputy assistant director there, and I th saw my role as management, as, as I was telling Joseph, is kind of holding back the hordes because the, as some of you said, you know, the staff, they get insular and they want to do something that's useful and feel good about it, and they want to sue everybody. Uh, but the hard question is, other than just putting good people in management in these agencies, how can you structurally uh, check them so that they don't do crazy things? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. I've thought about it a lot because I spent four years at the Justice Department and two years at the Federal, Federal Election Commission. Um, Frankly, one of the only ways you can do this is you've got to do what Congress has been unwilling to do, and that is put major cuts into the budget of the operations of the executive branch. Okay, And what I mean by that is um, whenever the Justice Department sues uh, towns and states and stuff, they often just roll over because the Justice Department seems to have endless resources. Yeah. It's particularly hard for small towns to fight back. Okay. Well, it is absolutely outrageous to me that over the past eight years, the U.S. Congress, often uh, controlled by Republicans, has increased the budget of the, of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Justice Department, which is one of the worst problems in the executive branch, every single year. They've got more lawyers today, almost a 1,000 staff, than they've ever had in their life. And if you cut their budget by 25%, 
then they're going to have to fire a lot of those lawyers. And the less resources they have, the less trouble they can cause. Uh, the, the other big thing that needs to be done, and, and I'll give you another example. You all know that um, the Obama administration, right, has, has sent out a guidance letter to universities all and, and uh, K through 12 all over the country telling them that if, if you don't um, change your bathroom policies, right, you're going to get uh, hurt by having potentially federal funds reduced, okay? That letter came out of, it's a joint letter from the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education and the Education section in the Civil Rights Department, uh, Division of the Justice Department. Well, in the damn budget this year, excuse my language, the House Republicans increased the budgets of those two offices. Why did they not reduce the budgets, particularly for the Office of Civil Rights, within the Department of Education to hit them for this? Now, the other big way to hit this besides uh, huge cuts in the budgets of all of these departments is that, look, uh, decades ago, the House actually had a budget process that they could use to hurt particular offices within particular executive agencies when they did bad things. You know, you want to send a message to the Attorney General of the United States over the fact that he's withholding all these documents you've subpoenaed, cut out his entire travel budget. <laughs> you know, do things to hurt him. They have been un unwilling to do that. And frankly, one of the reasons for that, and th th I have never heard anyone talk about this, is that, look, the way the current House of Representatives is organized, it was organized by de the Democratic Party when they were in control, and the committee system was organized in such a way to spend money, not stop money from being spent. And that means, for example, you may not realize this, that the House committees that have jurisdiction over particular federal agencies, they don't have the appropriations power. Okay, so for example, the House Judiciary Committee, its job is to oversee the, the U.S. Justice Department, to do oversight, to hold hearings, to find out what they're doing, what they're doing wrong. But they don't have the appropriations power. That, that is in one committee in Congress. And so that means that the people at the Judiciary Committee who have the most knowledge of what's going on in the agency they oversee are not the ones deciding how much money should be given to that agency. That appropriations power ought to be taken away from the appropriations committee and given to each committee for their particular agency because then they actually will have the ability to do the kind of targeted budget cuts like I'm talking about to actually hurt agencies. And if they went back to doing what they're supposed to do, which is 13, 13 12. budget, 12 budget bills, instead of one big one, well then, uh, they actually could have cut the funding for the Department of Homeland Security to put in the President's amnesty plan because they could have given him uh, 12 budget bills and what was he going to do? Veto all 12 of them because there's cut, a cut in the one budget that only covers DHS, but of course they don't do that. No, you, it's, it's a good answer. You avoid the fiscal cliff. You avoid all the pressure to pass that one budget if you can get back to 12 budgets. Uh, also, having been in the executive branch, it solves another problem because uh, Congress has trouble, believe it or not, getting documents out of executive agencies and making executive agents appear before them. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the oversight committees that have that trouble. The appropriators don't really have that same trouble because if you're going to give a document or not, if you want to become a $12 billion agency instead of a $13 billion agency, you give the document. So it solves that problem as well. I think the only line items in, in federal government that ought to be increased are the, the line items of the inspectors general. Um, <laughs> and, and Congress should develop better relationships with them as well because uh, they should be seen as, as eyes and ears of Congress, not of the agencies themselves. And as much as the oversight agencies know about the agencies, the IGs know 10 or 15 times more because they're on the scene. I also, I mean, I hate to keep spending all this time on this, but there's another major thing that needs to be done. There's no discussion of it. There's no talk about it. Uh, folks in Washington are afraid of it because of the strength of the public employee unions. Look, the career civil service system we have was put in in the 1880s. 
under Grover Cre Cleveland. And what it means is that it is impossible to fire a federal employee. I know that. I spent six years doing that. The only way you could get rid of a bad federal employee is to promote them to a different <laughs> position and transfer them out. And what that means is uh, we had people inside the Civil Rights Division who did everything they could to sabotage, for example, the priorities of the Bush administration, doing things that I consider to be unethical, uh, unprofessional, et cetera. We couldn't get rid of them. And you, the career civil service system, frankly, needs to be ended. And there's a great example of this. Uh, do you all remember Zell Miller, former Democratic uh, senator from the state of Georgia? He was the one who uh, once on TV uh, uh, challenged, uh, what's his name, Chris, uh, the MSNBC host to a duel. Chris Matthews. Chris Matthews, <laughs> right. When he was the governor of Georgia, he actually ended the career civil service system for Georgia state employees. They grandfathered it so that uh, anyone who was under the old system would stay, but all new employees after a particular date. And the whole point was to be able to fire bad employees and those who wouldn't carry out the directions of, of the governor. Now, everyone said, oh, you can't do that. When a new political go a governor comes in, well, he's going to fire everybody. That is practically impossible. In the federal government, there are three million federal employees. And new presidents who come in, they get a couple of thousand political appointees. They have trouble just finding enough people to fit those slots. So the idea that they could fire everybody is just not, not going to happen. But at least if you ended the system the way it is, you could get rid of bad people. One, one additional solution, when they have a snow day in Washington, D.C., that means you know they've got like a dusting of it in D.C., uh, all non-essential workers get to stay at home. Right. I think just take that mix right there and say, okay, you're not essential. Don't come in ever again. And that would solve the problem right there. You, you may not be able to, to fire the exact person, but how about the job that he's holding? Just eliminate the job that he's holding. How do well, you go about doing that? that? That's difficult to do because what Congress, what Congress does when it appropriates for particular government agencies it, it, it appropriates money for what they call FT, FTEs. Yeah, full-time employees. Full-time employee positions. So they fund the actual slots or positions. In the back. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this presentation today has been quite interesting. And uh, this presentation in my 30 years as an administrator in the Justice Department leads me to believe that the Orwellian monolith that we call Washington has completely swallowed the America of constitutionalism, federalism, of Marshall, of Madison, of Blackstonian judicial review. And after today, I feel like I'm one of those soldiers in the Philip Japanese soldiers in the Philippine Islands <laughs> fighting a war that has long been lost and ended. Uh, and so I, that leads me to my question is what is the probability in the view of the various panel members uh, that my view is wrong and that we are not a minority hiding in caves fighting a war loss, but we are the leading edge of a revolution that's going to change things? Thank you. <laughs> well, so I'll give the optimistic view. I, it, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, no, but I'll, I'll lay it out a little bit more. Um, it, it, it has taken 120 years to get here. So to think that we're going to get, get, get back to a constitutional form of government right away is, 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 is not right. Um, but there are things we can do. We can try to elect a president who has the power to not exercise power, who will appoint the 2,000 people that Hans met. Uh, mentioned that will see their power modestly and then a president that's strong enough to six months later make sure those people that he put in there are still you know doing very little that they're deregulating rather than regulating um, but you know this this problem grew up because states in the first instance gave power to the federal government so we need the states to continue to be strong and try and take back some of that power within the federal government itself we need the judges to sort of have a different view of the administrative state and there there is an awakening there I would say um, at the level of the Supreme Court um, and at some of the lower court levels but there's an awakening in society too um, we've done some 
focus group testing that's sort of discouraging about what people think about the regulatory state. Um, the average, I mean, educated person, uh, a person with a college degree who's engaged in society by a couple different measures, thinks that regulations are good. That's their first instinct. They keep us safe. Um, but they're educable. So as soon as you start giving them information about the cost of regulations per household, uh, they start to say, wait a minute. So um, some of it's PR. Uh, some of it is just good hard work that just goes on and on and on. I'm not worried about the Federalist Society putting itself out of business, so. John? Yeah, Lou. I would just like to say that everything we've learned has been filet mignon. I don't see any fat and grizzle in it at all, so I want to compliment everyone what they've done. But the next thing is, <laughs> you gotta go from words to action. I would hope that Claremont would be able, with the right funds and the right leadership, to train in each of these situations, you need to pick out a few so you can have some winning things. And then, believe me, those people that fund the presidential election will fund the reestablishment of to do what everything you, have, you guys have just said and what's happened before the, at this wonderful day. And, Anyhow. And I didn't I'm, even pay him for that. <laughs> Advertise the message. No, Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. You no, know, no. This, you're my brother. <laughs> and remember what uh, Benjamin Franklin said, if you can keep it. Yep. We're about ready to lose it. Yeah, very good. We got to get serious. Thank you. And it's got to happen. Thank you. I preached enough. Last, <laughs> last question before John, our break is John, to the judge. Can I? I'm just oh yeah, sure. Just to respond to that, I mean, I, I think Joseph, it's probably accurate to say that you know, we, you, Joseph and I interact with all these other state uh, solicitor general's office that are on the front lines of these these things, and I would say that. Um, Almost without exception, there may be an exception that that, that is the it's young people who are very would say the same thing I said about Claremont and Federal Society. So it really is these types of institutions that are making. You know, for those of you that are wondering, you know, does this does this actually is it just a group of us talking to each other and grumping about it, or is it actually to the extent that it is impacting a younger generation of of people and it, and it's a generation that talks to each other now. I don't know whether or not we're we're fighting a rear guard action, and we're going. I do think it is important that what we are doing, um, you know, whether or not depending whether whatever direction we end up going, it is important that we be defending these principles, and there and it, and it is really these groups that are that are um, educating the younger people about that, starting in law school with the Federalist Society. So um, you can be encouraged by that. Well, when 43 Republicans signed off on the president's transgender bill for the elementary schools throughout America, 43 Republicans, those 43 Republicans need to be called in on the carpet. Yep. Very good. Judge, last question. A lovely lady who had waited on us came up to me, hugged me, she is Hispanic, hugged me and said, thank you for all that you are doing, that all of you are doing, for standing up for our Constitution. It has to be protected. Very good. Well, I'm, I'm pretty gloomy about all this, but boy, that helped. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, if we would uh, uh, take a 10-minute break, try and be back here by 3.20, and the last session is what we're doing about it. So it will lead into that nicely. Thank you.